Chapter 2, Design by Design, The Birth of the Railway. The ultimate aim of a means of communication must be to reduce not the costs of transport, but the costs of production. Jules Dupuy, 1844. 2.1, Plateways to Railways. In the early 1800s, England's demand for coal was beginning to its long rise. The Peace family owned many of the Auckland coal fields near the town of Darlington. To develop and market Auckland coal, a considerable and risky investment in transportation was required. Edward Pease decided to take the risk and secured from Parliament an enabling act for construction in 1821. The proposal was for a conventional plateway, sometimes called a tramway or wagonway. The differences between a plateway and wagonway deal with a type of track. The term wagonways includes wooden track, while plateways had that track plated with iron. Those plates would later be L-shaped to keep the wheel on the track. Carts drawn by horses or mules were to be pulled along the rails fastened to stone or wood chairs, supports. Rails and chairs were spaced so that draft animals could walk between them. Rails at the time were either made of wood faced with an iron strip or iron plates with no wood backing. Where grades were steep, a fixed steam engine hauled cars using chains or ropes, cable cars. When practical, self-acting planes were used in which the gravity acting on full cars rolling downhill pulled empty cars uphill. The technology for wagonways is old, having evolved first in the metal mines of Central Europe and in the copper, lead, and zinc mines of England. There was a natural extension from these beginnings to hauling coal from mines to water. Propulsion was provided in near-level situations by horses. Sharp lifts were accomplished by horses turning capstans, rotating machines with a vertical axle, and by steam power when rotary power could be obtained from steam engines, about 1780. New animal-powered plateways were being built in the U.S., at least as late as 1826, when one opened in Quincy, Massachusetts, to haul rocks from quarry to dock. The rail evolved from iron strips fastened to wood through L-shaped plates to forms that began to look like today's T-shaped rail. Because the early plateways were associated with mines, they were financed, owned, and operated by mine operators. As canals expanded, plateways expanded. At first, this resulted from the new opportunities for mining. Later, plateways were incorporated in canal designs. Some served as feeders where canals could not be practically extended, and some served as sections of canals. Plateways were poised for another round of development just before the Stockton and Darlington was developed. Thomas Telford, whom we meet in discussion of turnpikes, had proposed upgrading the road system to plateways using L-shaped edge plates. He had incorporated parallel granite stones in the Hollyhead Road for use by coaches. The investment in the Stockton and Darlington plateway was risky, because the route was to be long relative to plateways at the times. Also, the high elevation of the coal fields and the topography of the route were unfavorable. Lots of up and down grades. In light of these difficulties, Pease's problem was to find an engineer who could keep construction and operating costs to a minimum. He found that engineer in George Stevenson, a self-taught mechanic with an excellent reputation. Stevenson did a superior job of engineering. Cuts and fills were balanced to reduce material handling costs, improving on best practices of the times, there was a combination of near-level grades and short, sharper grades to be worked with self-acting planes or steam engine rope haulage. Stevenson had experience with steam engine at coal mines, lifts, and pumps. He also rigged some locomotives. For reasons that likely had to do with Stevenson in Stevenson's interests, two locomotives were ordered. These were to be used as a horse. Just as a horse could, locomotives were to move three to six ton carts on level or near-level ground. The Stockton and Darlington was a success. It demonstrated that a well-thought-out design could make money. Success in the London coal market showed that clearly. It also showed that locomotives were a very effective substitute for horses. Indeed, they had the power to move multiple carts. Stevenson's next engine, Rocket, is shown. Emulation followed. Two point two, profile Richard Trevithick. Richard Trevithick, 1771 to 1833, developed the first practical locomotive. He began experiments in 1803, and his locomotives were operating on a colliery plateways at Leeds and on Tyneside in 1812, well before the 1824 opening date of the Stockton and Darlington. Trevithick grew up in the Cornwall mining region, where he obtained experience with Watts engines. A self-taught engineer, his first innovative effort conflicted with Watts' patents. To evade those, he developed the idea of strong, high-pressure steam. 
The steam expansion drove the piston, and once expanded, the steam was exhausted into the atmosphere. Watt's condenser was no longer needed. Other ideas then came quickly. Strong steam required a strong boiler, but the boiler could also be made smaller. To increase efficiency, Trevithick made boiler improvements, and the steam was exhausted via the chimney to improve draft. Safety valves and fusible plugs were developed. The smaller, more powerful engine was much better than Watts for transportation uses. Trevithick developed a steam road carriage in 1801. Not the first. Watt engines had been tried on vehicles in France and elsewhere. A gear-driven plateway locomotive in 1804 and a dredge in 1806. Later locomotives used connecting rods to crank pins. In addition to the carriage that was operated in London, Trevithick demonstrated a railway-like system. The single cylinder was set horizontally within the boiler. These and additional transportation efforts did not seed successful business ventures, and Trevithick lost interest in transportation and began to concentrate on mine machinery. That work yielded still another important improvement, the early cutoff of steam flow to the cylinder. Some others experimented with locomotives at the time, but Trevithick was clearly the leader. 2.3. Profile, George Stevenson. George Stevenson, 1781 to 1848, was born in Wylam, England. His family homestead was adjacent to the Wylam Wagonway, a facility with wooden tracks for horse-drawn carts, which had been built in 1748 to take the coal from Wylam to the River Tyne. In 1802, he took a job as an engine operator at a coal mine in Killingworth, and was later promoted to engine right. There, he developed a safety lamp that would not explode when near the volatile gases in the mines. In 1814, he stopped operating engines and started designing them. His first traveling engine, named Blucher, shown in the figure, was released in 1814. Blucher, the first locomotive to employ flanged wheels on a track, could haul 30 tons of coal at a time. By 1819, Stevenson constructed, constructed another 16 engines. His first railway ran for 13 kilometers between Hetton and Sunderland. This railway used gravity to move the cargo downhill and locomotives to go flat and uphill. It is considered the first railway to avoid animal power. This led to his job with the Stockton and Darlington discussed above. The Stockton and Darlington broke some other records. The locomotion, built with his son Robert, hauled an 80-ton load a distance of 14 kilometers at a peak speed of 38 kilometers per hour. It also included the first intentional passenger car. His innovations were not simply with the engine, but also with the trackage and right-of-way. Stevenson insisted upon keeping railway inclines to a minimum, using cut and fill extensively. The locomotion developed for the Stockton and Darlington was a crude locomotive compared to Trevithick's. A craftsman, Stevenson's contribution was the way he placed the building blocks into a successful format. Later, in working with his son Robert, 1803 to 1859, Stevenson developed a successful line of locomotives, and he was an important promoter and developer. Stevenson continued as chief railway engineer with the Bolton and Ley, the Liverpool and Manchester, Manchester and Leeds, Birmingham and Derby, Normanton and York, and Sheffield and Rotherham Railways. The above description of the Stockton and Darlington is just that, description. Causality is explored only to the level of proximate cause. For instance, Pease had energy and took risks. Stevenson was a skilled engineer who knew cost-effective designs. Once the Stockton and Darlington was in place, emulation played a major role and diffusion was rapid. Let's dig deeper. One remarkable thing about the Stockton and Darlington was the way it stretched the state of the transportation art. A critic of the Times might have said it had no prospects. Existing transportation systems were built out and mature. Canals, plateways, and roads had been built where the topography was reasonable and the economics was right. The task was that of managing what had been constructed and making marginal improvements. Indeed, John Loudon McAdams' famous book on roads and other publications were addressed to just that. They were mainly addressed to road pavements, McAdam surfaces, and toll road management. Although today McAdam, who we will meet in section 3.4, is known for the McAdam Road, at the time his fame was as a manager. With respect to the Auckland coal fields, a canal was out of the question. The coal fields were at a high elevation and difficult construction and many locks would have been required. Road wagon costs were, were too high. A facility with some plateway features was the only option. The text, Woods Railway Treaties, reprinted at the end of this chapter, emphasizes costs, features of the route, and details of engineering. Similar topics are found in the literature of the times. This was done here, that was done there, where this and that refer to engineering details and costs. Today's reader might be surprised by how much was known about the strength of metals, but not fatigue, the resolution of forces, and other enduring topics. 
The author of Wood's Railway Treaties makes the point that the Stockton and Darlington was not the first railway. He cites some plateways in England, and we know of some existing at the time in the U.S., Germany, and France. The author failed to realize that on the dimensions such as scales, capability to manage throughput, institutional arrangements, and profitability, the Stockton and Darlington was quite different from previous plateways. It was a new combination of old things that opened a new way to provide transportation services. The lesson is simply that the new has a lot of the old in it, and that the essence of new is in combinations. Two point five design by design. It was already mentioned that Stevenson used best practice from Plateway and other construction. He borrowed from previous construction learning. Note that we said best practice and not standard practice, and note also that this best practice was carefully applied to the physical and market situations. Similar remarks may be made about the design and use of locomotives. The technology was tailored to the physical situation and to the market niche. There was also borrowing and tailoring in operations, policies, and finance. In particular, the common carrier concept was borrowed from the canals where schedules of tolls were published. Anyone could bring their boat and use a canal as long as they paid the toll. That generally was not the situation on plateways that were associated with a particular property and operated by the owner. Most were short, downhill all the way in the traffic direction, and fed traffic from mines to canals. With an expensive fixed plant, Pease no needed traffic to cover costs, and the desire for traffic was the motive for the common carriage policy. Some feeder routes were built to, to tap mines owned by others. Stevenson and Pease developed a design in a market niche. It was the design that was new. The innovation itself was a design. With the play on words, it was a design by design. On purpose, it was a new design built from old building blocks. Except for the design, there was nothing new about the Stockton and Darlington. There was already knowledge and policy relative to transport enterprises, their financing, construction, tariffs, etc. The technologies were not new. Stevenson had previously constructed a locomotive for the Killingworth Colliery, building on Watts' improvements of the steam engine. Others had built locomotives, and many were better than Stevenson's. Yet, based on the above arguments, we claim the Stockton and Darlington was not a mere plateway. It was the world's first railway. 2.6. Defining the railway. Peace had a clear but difficult cost-oriented objective keep costs down in order to make money. The problem of cost was deepened when the decision to, was made to use locomotives, the original plateway charter had to be revised. The political deal making to accomplish the charter revision worsened Peace's situation. A London coal dealer and member of parliament, John Lambton, insisted on a constraint on coal tariffs to be transshipped to London. Per unit distance rates on London coal were set at one eighth those for local destinations. Peace had to have costs lower than that seemingly impractical rate. That's partly why Pease used the common carrier format. Pease had to learn how to make the common carrier concept work. For instance, he began by purchasing cars and wagons for lease to independent operators. He was learning about non-coal traffic, how much, how to price it, and services to be provided. In particular, and much to the surprise of managers, passenger traffic swelled and became an unexpected source of revenue. Other questions included, how reliable were locomotives? How many carts could they train? And what were the costs? Would the wheels slip under load? Did rolling resistance increase with velocity? What type of rail worked best? How to control traffic? What were the best mechanical transshipment devices? Should tracks be set in stone or wooden chairs? Not everything went smoothly. At first, passengers were hauled on coal cars. The first passenger car constructed was so heavy that it could not be hauled up grade when loaded. Learning continued on railways that emulated the Stockton and Darlington. Learning and change based on learning were so rapid that Wood's treaties confused the question of the first railway. In many ways, the Stockton and Darlington was a plateway with locomotives operating on level or near level grade, and some things like that had been developed earlier. But the Stockton and Darlington was a proof of concept quite different from earlier developments. 2.7 Discussion the Stockton and Darlington experience says a good bit about how revolutionary change occurs in transportation. Much of what it says is contrary to common wisdom, both today and at the times. At the time, it was well known that transportation was pretty much limited to tram, canal, maritime, and road systems. Nothing else was needed or practical, and management of existing systems was the priority. A similar view is wisdom today. A fixed production set exists. Let's manage it. Yet experience says that revolutionary change occurs in market niches and by design. 
old building blocks are arranged in new designs, and the steam engine and locomotive were among those old building blocks, for they had been available for about 30 years. Some building blocks were hard technology ones, others were soft, such as the common carriage format and construction know-how. Building blocks are borrowed. The experience says that markets and production formats are found by inquiry and learning. Change is very rapid when designs are found that bring new resources into the economy, Auckland coal, and support new activities, passenger transportation and its purposes. Although not discussed, experience says that financing will be found if a design is successful. Pease got his first round from Quaker-controlled banks operated by his relatives. But once the viability of railways was understood, there was an abundance of financing available. Acquiring land was not trivial, and the side payments to the powerful had to be arranged. Finally, experience says that radical change can occur in short time frames. We view policies as rules for the control of the flow of information and materials. More about this in Chapter 31. That is, a broad abstraction. To use it, let's divide policies into one, those based on social and political consensus, and established and implemented by law or social custom, and two, those created by the modes for their own purposes and embedded in modal practice. Except for the remarks about obtaining charters from Parliament, nothing was said about the first type of policy. Parliament was exercising policy on how to birth organizations, policy based on previous experiences. Embedded policy was discussed. We talked about policy borrowed from previous experiences, rules for construction, common carriage, and so on, and policy created by the mode to meet its needs. The latter were design rules in the main. One purpose for reviewing the Stockton and Darlington in the first part of the transportation experience was to illustrate how we can interpret experience. Our discussion began with description. Widening it, we saw how the Stockton and Darlington related to its context and triggered consequential change in transportation services. By consequential, we mean that productivity at least doubled. By change, we mean that it offered new options for production and consumption. Public policy didn't play much of a role in occasioning consequential development. Development occurred because innovators did things. Can we learn enough about policy to be proactive on consequential transportation development matters? Our second purpose was more general. If we avoid concentrating on petty details and strive to generalize, we will find that there has been a transportation experience. The realizations of the experience have involved different actors, technologies, and geographical and temporal stages, but similarities overwhelm differences. Although we have only begun to examine the experience, it's not too early to ask where the Stockton and Darlington fits in the experience and how is it similar to other things in the experience. This chapter referred to the design of a new system using old building blocks. Although not yet discussed, we will see close analogs among Juan Tripp's Pan American Airlines service developments in the 1920s and 30s in Chapter 12, Malcolm McLean's Sealand Container Services of the 1950s in Chapter 19, and the Stockton and Darlington. The early development of auto highway transportation and some other developments do not compare so easily, but they do compare. Our discussion treated the Stockton and Darlington. We saw more than the birth of the railway, for the discussion treated the search of the workable institutional and technological designs. We saw the birth, system shakeout, and design revisions. The easy lesson from the Stockton and Darlington, which began operating in 1825, was that plateways could be built at a larger scale and scope than had been imagined before. Using Stevenson's steam engine and edge rail, large volumes of bulk traffic could be moved at low cost. As a consequence, 50 or so plateway proposals emerged in the decade after the Stockton and Darlington opened. Most were cable cars, powered by stationary steam engines and cables both for incline and flat running. Some were to be mainly locomotive powered. The idea extended to continental Europe. The St. Etienne Railway, completed in 1828, is said to be the first French railway. It was a plateway with some locomotives built on the English model and linked the Loire Valley with Paris to move coal. It was soon extended to Lyon and carried passengers. In the 1980s, this line was upgraded to a TGV, high-speed passenger rail. 